Hello everybody, thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to go over programming a 2.0 Fire subscriber. First we're going to go through what changes need to be made with every installation, and then we're going to go through all of our default settings in case you need to change them for some sort of specialized installation. There are two main ways of connecting to the 2.0 Fire subscriber. One of them is with a USB Wi-Fi adapter. The part number is 77 dash Wi-Fi. And I also highly recommend that you purchase those from AES. There are other versions out there that will not work with the subscriber. If you purchase them from us, we guarantee they will work with our subscribers. You can also use an ethernet cable with a laptop. If you are going to connect via Wi-Fi, plug in the USB dongle and then look for a Wi-Fi network called AES 2.0 dash the last three digits of the serial number of the device. You can find this by looking at the LCD screen on the front or there should be a sticker that has the serial number on the subscriber. Select this Wi-Fi network and if you're working with Windows 10 laptop, note that you need to click the link where it says use passphrase. Then you will enter 7707 fire. This is a hard coded password for all of our subscribers and that will give you access to the subscriber programming. After that, you just open a web browser and navigate to the IP address that will be on the front LED screen. You will have to click the black button a few times to see the IP address. We also highly recommend using Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, Internet Explorer does have some known bugs. One thing to note is that you cannot use the handheld programmer. This is only for our legacy subscribers. If you've connected to the Wi-Fi network, from here on connecting with Ethernet and connecting with Wi-Fi are the same. You find the IP address in the front LED screen and then type it into a Chrome, Firefox, Safari browser, anything other than Internet Explorer. The default username and password is admin admin, and I would highly suggest that everybody change their default password because admin admin is about the most basic password ever. After you've entered admin admin, hit login and then we'll get to the subscriber programming. As I said before, enter admin admin to log in. And the first page you'll see is going to be the status page. On the top of the status page, we have our status. So this will reflect any faults that are on your subscriber. The sub ID, the link layer, the netcon, and if it's connected via IP, what receiver it's connected to. Below that, we'll see a list of all eight routes. So this shows the eight different radios that the subscriber can communicate with. And you'll notice we have all good signals. Generally, out in the field, you'll see the last couple of routes might say marginal. Since we are connected via Ethernet, we see that the IP receivers are connected. And below we have a list of all the hardware. We have our model type, which is a 7707 fire, the serial number, if there are any cards in Zone Bank 1 or Zone Bank 2. The panel interface is if we have an IntelliPro installed. And then we have our MAC address, our IP address, and if there's any Wi-Fi access point installed. All right, now that we've covered what's on the status screen, let's go up to configuration and let me show you the two things that that need to change with every installation. We'll select configuration and then what we're going to do is we're going to change the sub ID. So I'm going to go ahead and change it to 5533. This you want to match to the account ID of the fire panel. Hit select save changes and it will say click update from the menu bar to confirm changes. If you're accessing this from your phone you will have three little lines in the top right hand corner. Select the three little lines in the top right hand corner and then hit update. But we we have one more change to make. We have to go down and we want to make sure to enter the cipher code. This is a four digit hex number that you need to have before leaving the shop. AES does not know your cipher code. The one time our tech support will be a little less than helpful is if you're installing a new radio and you're not able to get it on the network. They're going to ask you, do you know your cipher code? If you say, yeah, I think it's 4444. They're going to ask you to hang up and call your shop and confirm the cipher code. Because if you don't know your cipher code, no matter what we do, you're never going to get on the network. So we'll go ahead and enter the cipher code and then hit save changes. 
We want to make sure our check-in interval is set to 23 hours and 45 minutes. Now this is very important because we want to make sure if it's set to 24 hours, it's going to check in at the same time every day. And what we see with other networks for people that have it set to 24 hours is that we see large amounts of traffic during the day when these radios are first turned on and then it plummets at night. So here, for example, is a network that has it set to 24 hours. We can see giant spikes during the day and then the network load dies down in the evening. And with every spike in network activity, we see a little tiny spike in act delays. And that's because there's too much traffic on the network for the subscriber to properly acknowledge all of the check-ins. If you change it to 2345, what we see is the network load smooths out much, much more. And you'll notice there are no act delays on this network. Now that we've made all the changes required on this page, what we're going to do is we're going to go up and hit the update button. I highly recommend hitting update anytime you make changes to a tab before switching to a different tab. Anytime you update the cipher code for a subscriber, it will automatically reset. Now that we've entered the sub ID in the cipher, what we're going to do is figure out how we want to connect the subscriber to the fire alarm panel. Under the accessories tab, we'll see we can program the dry contact zones. There are four options for each of the eight zones. Fire, supervised, tamper, and bypassed. Be careful using the supervised as this sends an alarm on open and an alarm on short. We find most people generally, if they're using the dry contacts, will use zone one, two, and three, and then zone eight, for a tamper. So we'll select tamper and you'll see the restoral flag automatically selects, hit save changes, and then we'll scroll to the top of the screen and update those changes to send them to the subscriber. If you're going to connect our subscriber using the fire alarm panels dialer, what you need to do is scroll to the bottom of this screen where you'll see our IntelliPro menu. One of the main features I want to show you today, and we are going to do a whole video on programming the IntelliPro, is the AP account override flag right here. If you have a fire alarm panel that it's hard to gain access to, like a simplex panel, or something like that, and the AP report format is already set to CID, what you can do is select this flag and it will overwrite the account ID from the fire panel with the subscriber ID programmed into the AES subscriber before passing it along to the central station. So as long as your alarm panel is set to report in CID, you don't actually need to gain access to it to install a subscriber. All you need to do is program into the subscriber what you want the account ID and then make sure to hit the AP account override flag, save changes, and then update your radio and you will be all set. And we're going to hit update to send those changes to the radio. And those are really the few things that need to be changed with every installation. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to go to the system tab and walk you through some of the new features for our 2.0 radios. The first thing in the system tab is where you can change the password. First, you'll have to enter your current password and then enter a new password twice. Once again, we highly recommend changing your password from admin. Additionally, you can have multiple different users and we'd recommend ideally that everybody have their own username and password so you can create users here as well. There are also some other options such as disabling the onboard buzzer or the LCD status screen in the front. One of the other more handy features of our 2.0 subscribers is you can download the the current settings from this subscriber and then put it onto all the other subscribers. So if you have a set way you configure all of your subscribers, you can get one subscriber with all your users, names, passwords, zone settings, everything set exactly how you want it, and then download it from that subscriber and use a USB thumb drive to upload it to all the rest of the subscribers. If you ever want to default a subscriber, you'd select these two flags and then hit reset configuration and this will default the subscriber. Note that it will not remove the cipher code or the sub ID. Everything else will be returned to default. Below is our system firmware update. You can go ahead and update the firmware. We recommend that you do not update this while over Wi-Fi. We want to make sure you have a hard connection 
installation because if the Wi-Fi signal cuts out at a specific point during the installation, you can brick your subscriber. Download support files is mainly something you'd use if tech support directs you to, but you can go in there and check on configuration files, system log files, health files, or tool files if you want to explore further yourself. There is also a software restart all the way at the bottom of the systems tab. Now I want to scroll all the way to the top and go to the tools tab. In tools we will see some text messages previously entered into the subscriber. With this feature, if it's set up properly with your alarm automation software, it will allow you to send messages back to the central station. If you scroll down, we'll see a list of all of the different alarms that have been sent. You can filter this by the subscriber or the panel. Sometimes these alarms are coming in quite quickly, so you can pause them. Similarly with all of the RF traffic, you can see the traffic coming in live, and you can filter it by transmitting, receiving, or transmitting and receiving. The All tab will also show any subscriber repeating that it's doing as well. If we continue to scroll down, we'll see our IP traffic. This shows all of the traffic that's gone through the data connection. Once again, you can pause this and clear it as well. And then below that, we have RF antenna test. This is where we can hook up the bird watt meter between the trans. This is where we can hook up the bird watt meter in between the transceiver and the antenna. This will allow us to see how much power is going out to the antenna, and then we can test the reflected power that's coming back in from the antenna. It will key the transceiver for five seconds, allowing you an easier time to read the gauge. Below we have ping, where if you're using an IP connection, you can ping the multi-net receiver. And then we have system activity log. One of the main reasons I'd want you to set up individual usernames and passwords is so you can see exactly who made any changes to the subscriber. Notice here it will always say admin, admin admin, admin, because this is the only user set up on this subscriber. If you had individual subscriber IDs, you could see exactly who did what in your subscriber. This is very handy for service technicians. Two weeks ago, the subscriber stopped working and they want to see if there are any changes that caused it to stop working. I would look here first for a cause of the issue. Now we've already changed the sub ID and the cipher code in the configuration tab, but let's go back and see what else is in there. So I'll click on the configuration tab, and the first thing we see is the sub ID. Below the sub ID, we have event reporting. There are five options, radio only, radio and internet, this will send two signals back to your central station, radio with internet backup, internet with radio backup, and internet only. The reason for the internet only is if you want to put a subscriber at a customer location but they don't have a radio network built up around them, what you can do is select internet only and then once the radio mesh network is built up around the subscriber, you can switch it over to a radio option. Below that we have our cipher code and our check-in interval which we've talked about previously. Here you can also disable repeating if you don't want this radio doing any repeating. Note though that if you disable repeating, this is no longer a UL installation and should only be done in very rare circumstances. Below that, we have our central receiver configuration. This is if you're using the 2.0 radio to connect via IP. You need to enter the IP address primary receiver and the secondary receiver. And then note that the internet check-in interval is going to be something less than six hours. We generally recommend five hours and 55 minutes. Below that, we have our flexible power options. There are two main options, AC or DC power, 16 and a half volts AC or 24 volts DC. Please be careful not to select an option without a battery as you will not get any battery faults. We also have the option for AC report delay and we highly recommend keeping this selected as R. R is for random. So if all the subscribers in an area lose power, they will report exactly after 100 minutes so all of the radios will be talking at the exact same time. If you enter this as R, this will give each radio a random time so that they'll all have a chance to communicate. Below that, we have locally announced AC faults. With the subscriber, there is a PZO built into the front cover of the subscriber, so this can locally announce anytime there's an AC fault. Below that, there's options for suppressing other faults, AC fault, battery fault, or charger fault, and then below that we have where you can suppress ground faults. Please do not use any of the suppression faults unless you are testing with a subscriber. Below that we have our time to live settings. 
This sets a time limit on the radio packets. So if an alarm hasn't gotten back to the central station within three hours, the packet will disappear. This is very handy if you ever have a subscriber that's putting a lot of traffic on your network, as it can take a long time to recover if you do not have these set. So please leave them as the default. If you see any radio that's set to zero, that means forever, which means any radio packet that comes out of your radio will have to go through an IP link and then a receiver before it gets to your alarm automation software. There is a known issue where if the J4 trouble relay is connected to a reporting zone on the fire panel, you can see a lot of signals come out of one of these radios as it creates a loop situation. So we highly recommend setting the time to live settings as our default. Three hours for critical alarms, 10 minutes for non-critical alarms. Also, we have the subscriber here set to a static IP. If you have this set to a static IP, you need to supply the IP address, subnet mask, gateway, and DNS servers are optional. The last tab I want to show you is the statistics tab. This will give you an idea on utilization of the RF radio. Notice that this radio is only being utilized at 5% of capacity. There are also options for battery voltage primary AC or DC voltage, and then both as well. Let's take a look at this. As you would imagine, the voltage stays pretty constant, but you can always check these. All right, and that's pretty much everything for AES's 2.0 radio programming. Let's have a little bit of a wrap up. First, we want to make sure that you have your cipher code before leaving the shop. You have a laptop with an Ethernet cable or a 77 Wi-Fi dongle and a Wi-Fi enabled device. You want to make sure to match the subscriber ID and the account ID of the fire panel. Program the zones or the IntelliPro based on your installation. Leave the defaults in place unless there's a reason to change. And remember, when in doubt, the reset button is your friend. Thank you very much. If you have any additional questions about 2.0 subscriber programming, please stay tuned for our tech support number. We'll be happy to help. Have a great day.